before I introduce you. So, uh, like always, um, good afternoon, Europe, good morning, United States, and wherever else you are in the world. It's nice to see so many people again joining us for today's fine seminar, which I'm really very much looking forward to hear the newest results from Barbara Taborski. But I have two quick announcements to make before uh, I forget to do this at the end of, of this series today. First, um, next week, we will have a presentation by Adriana Maldonada Chaparro on social and demographic consequences of changing environments. Also going to be a very interesting talk. I um, expect that she will mainly talk about her work in birds and zebra finches. I know that she is a brilliant scientist. She wanted to join us in Strasbourg, but then unfortunately got another position somewhere else. But um, it's still great that um, we, we can interact also like this. Then the second announcement I want to make is um, that we are already planning um, the fall um, term of the fine seminar. We have already nearly all the slots full. We still have some people that we asked. I can I, I only you can quickly see the names. I don't want to give you details here, but just that you know we are on it. We have the privilege that alone in the um, permanent fine audience, we have at least 50, 60 people that we could invite and making it very difficult for us to decide who to invite. What we try to do is to get a diversity of taxa, like that we don't only have mammals and primates, but also birds, fish, and, and, and also, um, for example, Hannah Koko, um, somebody who comes from the theoretical side. In, in the fall, we will also have more talks like by um, Wolfgang Goyman and, and there was someone else um, who is also looking more into um, physiology, Annalise Berry, for example. So just to let you know, there is something coming again starting the 7th of September. And also to let you know, we know that there are so many brilliant people here in the audience and we will still hopefully invite all of you. We just talked that... Um, we still have many years to come that we want to continue this even outside the pandemic because otherwise we could not meet weekly and we hope that we can offer you an interesting term in fall as well with a diversity of um, um, topics and, and study systems. But now it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Barbara Taborski, uh, a scientist uh, very well known for her studies on um, adaptive developmental plasticity and epigenetics in cichlid fish. So she is working on the topic how early experiences form adaptive phenotypes that enable individuals um, to cope with change, uh, especially important in our um, current period. Barbara is originally from Austria. She is now an associate professor in Switzerland in Bern, but she did her PhD in Vienna in Austria and she actually started working um, with birds. Her PhD was on kiwis, like she did some very interesting studies on the variation in mating systems in this uh, in the kiwi from New Zealand. After her PhD, she moved on um, to the cliff, which is also the Conrad Lawrence Institute, which is also in Vienna working on cuckoos. And she was there interested in the question whether um, cuckoos are more imprinted on the habitat they grow in, up in, or on the host that they um, grew up in, in the nest in. And then only later she um, moved to fish and she realized like I did that there are great system to do proper experiments in captivity in the field. I unfortunately moved on to much more difficult mammals um, that are also very interesting, but where one cannot do such nice experiments while she um, kept on working on these um, um, especially chicken fish from Lake Tanchanika in East Africa. And she's doing really very exciting um, studies on them, especially on developmental plasticity. And yeah, with this, I would like to ask you, Barbara, to share your screen and would like to say thank you very much for joining us tonight and giving a presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for this introduction. Um, so my screen um, yeah it's a it's a uh, sorry 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 we had a test before and I was already further down it's a, it's truly exciting to to speak in this seminar series it has really become a highlight of the weekend I, I really hope that you 
will be able to continue that for many future years. And it seems you are not running out of, of super exciting speakers. Um, yeah, so today's talk is about plastic social phenotypes as it was announced. And I would like to start with a few examples to give you an impression of what I'm talking about. So we probably are all fascinated by the uh, morphological diversity and also the social diversity of, of different um, castes in social insects, like for example in honeybees where you have a large reproductive queen and you have uh, workers that, that fulfill different tasks. And it's even more extreme if you look at termites. This is a female, this is basically a, a large gonad. This is a large male here. And then you have different types of workers, soldiers and, and foragers. And what people often forget when they see that is that all this is a plastic early life specialization, which is coming about by the food these animals get early in life and thereby they specialize into the different roles. Um, there are also a lot of social phenotypes that are perhaps not visible at first sight because they have no morphological diversification, but still the, the social role as a social phenotype is connected to life history trajectories. And this is what I'm interested also in, in my study species. For example, in the male Western bluebirds, you have two types of males. One is more aggressive and um, is more dispersive. So they also settle new habitats um, and they are more successful in dispersing. And then you have a non-aggressive male type, which is more philopatric and that achieves a greater success by um, being tolerant and nesting near relatives. Um, and also these uh, male types, which is now known from recent work of the group of René Duckworth, they are come about to a large degree um, plast plastic by maternal effects or by non-genetic maternal effects by um, the stress the mother is exposed during breeding. Um, other examples um, are where well, you have social phenotypes and life history trajectories that are coupled are from yellow-bellied uh, marmots where more social individuals are less likely to disperse and the same was found in this bumblebee species here. Um, so when I talk about social phenotypes, I refer to both of these possibilities. I have depicted here, um, there could be uh, consistent behavioral types so that certain individuals always display in all kinds of situations, display a certain behavior more than another. So assume you have here on the X axis uh, an interacting Conspecific, it shows some kind of behavior, let's say aggression, and um, there may be behavioral types which are always responding more by submission than other individuals. But I'm also um, referring to when some individuals are able to respond more flexibly to a situation. So if, if an individual is attacked, some individuals are all um, have a steeper response in the amount of submission they show. So they, if that is an appropriate behavior, so if you are submissive towards an attacking dominant, for example, um, then we refer to this kind of behavioral flexibility as social competence. Um, so how can uh, such social phenotypes come about? I think there are three possibilities there could be a genetic polymorphism or there could be developmental plasticity that brings this sort of uh, permanent or consistent um, social phenotypes about. And one possibility is social niche specialization. And another possibility is that animals grow up in different environments and respond differently to the environments they experience early in life. Um, so I'm actually only aware of one example for a genetic polymorphism, and this is in male rhesus macaques. So in these macaques, they have um, a polymorphism of the serotonin transporter gene. There is a long allele and a short allele. And those males that have a long allele um, are more sociable, so they show more grooming, they show more social proximity, and they are more tolerant. And they, this is again linked to the life history, they delay dispersal. 
So this is all I will say about genetic polymorphisms in this talk, and the rest will be about developmental plasticity. So as I said, there are these two possibilities. You can have social phenotypes that come about by what we call social niche specialization. In this case, um, animals grow up in exactly the same environment, at least from our perspective, for example, they, they grow up in the same brood, so they are brood mates. And still they can, while being in the same environment, they can specialize for different social behaviors and different social roles. So in this case, we speak of social niche. They, 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 they find a social niche and specialize for it. The other possibility is perhaps what is most people have come across is um, that animals that grow up in different environments, they pick up different environmental cues and they take these cues and that determines the development of their phenotype. So we have, we start from individuals that are, let's say, genetically the same and they specialize because of environmental cues they experience during early life. And this is also the form of plasticity that was explained last week very nicely by Dustin Rubenstein. So we have the same genetic um, um, material as at, at the beginning, but still the phenotype looks different later because they underwent different environmental influences. And typically this can come about by parental effects. So something the parents do to their offspring either by substituting the eggs or by showing certain parental behavior or it can be early life effects so that what the offspring uh, cues the offspring experience itself. Um, so I will talk about these two types of um, social phenotypes and I will ask how social phenotypes arise in my main study system which are cooperative cichlids. I will ask why do they exist and at the, at the very end I will also shortly talk of what we think which mechanisms are underlying the social phenotypes. Um, first, uh, because not everybody may be extremely familiar with the uh, cichlid system, I will make a slightly longer introduction into the system. So here you see what we see when we go diving in Lake Tunganika. This is our study area. And in fact, all these fish here belong to our study species, uh, Neolampologus pulcher. And you see a lot of stones and you see also some white stones here. And these stones mark the center of the territory because we brought these stones down to, to mark the territories. So you have one territory here and you see a group of fish. You have one territory here, you have another one here and you have one here. So you see these fish are colonial. They are in a very uh, handy territory size of, of a meter or a meter and a half. Every, everything is close by and you can swim down and study these fish right away. Um, Neolampologus pulcher are cooperative breeders. They share the common um, traits of cooperative breeders. They have alloparental care. They have overlapping generations in the sense that even adults are still at the territory and help. Um, they have reproductive division of labor. So um, reproduction is done by uh, breeder pair and the subordinate helpers forego on reproduction to help. Um, what is what they also have is what not all cooperative breeders have is a division of labor between helping duties. So different group members do different helping duties. And these roles depend in these fish, like almost everything in fish depends on body size. These fish grow indeterminately, so it, it, it cannot be fully separated from age, but because they have a broad range of body sizes, it is also obvious that they specialize in jobs that can be better done by a small fish or by a large fish. And I will show you in a second what these fish are doing. So just briefly, our fish live in Lake Tanganyika. This is this lake here. Here for your reference, this is Lake Victoria, this is Lake Malawi. They all host wonderful radiations of cichlids. In Lake Tanganyika, we have about 250 species and many of them are endemic, also our study species. And we study them here in the very southern tip in, in Zambia. Um, so just to introduce the fish to you, this is a typical 
family group. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody is related, but we come to that. But you see all groups have a breeder male, which is the largest fish. The second largest fish is a breeder female. And then you see an, a bunch of different fish hanging around and these are the subordinate helpers. And they live in a breeding cavity, which we normally cannot access in the field, which is under big stones. Um, so some uh, background information. Uh, all these fish live in social groups. There's always a breeder pair. Um, and each territory has one female. So that is one female owns one territory, but males can defend one to three territories, which they patrol really in a regular scheme. So they come back every 20 minutes um, to, to each territory and check on it. Uh, and then we have, that is also special in these fish, a wide variety of group sizes. So you can have one helper, but you can also have 20 or even more. And then there are typically young of recent clutches there, which are the beneficiaries of the help. Um, what you can also see if you look very closely is that this fish here has a color mark, by the way. It's so we can mark them and follow them over the years. Um, so here you can get a better idea about this, what I meant about variable group sizes. You have here the group size in one year and you see there are at least three group members, a pair and a helper, but there is a wide range of group sizes. The other thing you can see here is that if you are in a member of a large group in one year, you are also a member of a large group in the next year. This is important for a point I come to later about the predictability of the environment. So the social environment is predictable. Um, so what do these helpers do, these the subordinates? They help to defend the territory against predators and conspecifics, space competitors, everything. And they do direct good care. Um, I will show you what that means uh, in, in a separate slide. So yeah, all young subordinates start their life as a helper, um, but they help to varying degrees. So not everybody is working at the same rate. Um, when they become adults, many of them stay as helpers, as I said before, and then they don't reproduce or maybe they, they steal a little bit of the fertilizations, but they don't have own broods. Um, but they have also the option to disperse, to disperse to a different territory, either to join that as a helper or to become a breeder. Um, dispersal is quite dangerous, one should say, in these fish. Um, so many of them don't make it. They are uh, adult helpers are fully fecund, um, and there is no morphological differentiation in, in respect to the different roles. So here is what the fish are doing. So this is what I call direct uh, brood care. So the small helpers say they clean the eggs from microbes and fungi. So you see these little gray things here, these are the eggs. This is of course um, flower pot as we have it in the lab. This is not a natural cavity and helpers nip on these eggs to clean them. Um, then what they also do is to maintain the territory to remove sand from the breeding cavity, which is a very important duty and then they defend against predators, large predators also, which are also dangerous for these fish. And they pre defend against uh, egg predators, which are able to enter the breeding cavity. You see that they are quite elongated and to eat the eggs. Um, just to give you an impression, because I like it so much, how this egg cleaning behavior looks like. I hope that you can smoothly see the video, which I will now play. So you see again here, these little gray things, these are the eggs. This is again a flower pot in the lab and the small helpers, the very small helpers, they do this micro nipping or however you want to call it. They, they clean the eggs from fungi. They don't eat the eggs. Now and then it happens. And who also cleans the egg as you came just in is the breeder female. So these small helpers and breeder females, they are contributing to this egg care. Um, okay, so as I said, they, there is this sort of size and age dependent division of labor, which is given by the fact that these fish grow indeterminately so that you have 
small helpers and large helpers, just to come back to these pictures I just showed you and who is doing what. So very small helpers and breeder females do egg cleaning and also fanning. So they also fan oxygen to the eggs. Um, then we have the, the, a, a nice division of labor between large and small helpers in the field. The large helpers and also the breeder female who does basically almost everything, they dig the sand, probably because they are, sorry, more efficient in, when they take a mouthful of sand that is more efficient than such, if such a small uh, helper would dig. Whereas the small helpers, they've um, rather do the defense against these small egg predators. And um, the real voracious, dangerous predators are mostly um, dealt with either by the breeder pair, especially again the female, or sometimes um, also very large helpers. When some, some of the large helpers almost have the size of a, of a breeder pair. Okay. Good, so one question we are usually asking when we are talking about social species, although discussions with Karsten showed that we should perhaps rather ask why species are, uh, species are not social. So why are these uh, fish staying and why are they helping? Um, these fish have one big problem. As I just mentioned, they have these very big predators which can prey on, this is a small exemplar, Big predators can prey also on, on, on adult um, uh, poultry. So we found that um, these fish, when they are alone as a breeder pair, they cannot sustain a territory, they are wiped out. So just to give you an impression about this, what these predators are doing here, you see a, a helper that is at risk. You see another helper coming with the maximum speed it can to attack this predator, but in this case, it came too late and the helper was eaten. So um, over the years, we had several studies that indicate that this social sociality in this species is driven by predation risk. And I will show you one experiment uh, that shows this. And this is a field experiment. This is something super nice in this fish. You can not only nicely work with them experimentally in the lab, but also in the field. And we have also a nice place for that, which is called Tanganyika Science Lodge, formerly Tanganyika Lodge, which is now run by University of Bern, or to be precise, by, by Michael. So this is the place where scientists are welcome to come to do their research. And uh, this experiment used underwater cages, two by two by two meters, which you see here. And you can see that these cages, they have a window where you can look in, but they all are a door and they are open underneath. So what you can do with these cages is to put them over the territories of the existing territories of the fish. And it is a nice tool. It is a bit difficult to bring them out. It needs a lot of personnel to place a cage in the right place. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, seven people bringing out this cage. Um, but in the end, it was quite a rewarding experiment. So what, was, what Dick Hech, a former postdoc of Michael Taborski did is to place this cage over four territories and three territories were inhabited by the cichlids and one territory he made empty. And then he added either a large predator like this guy here or an intermediate sized predator or no predator as a control. And the question was, would predation risk um, makes a fish stay at home or would it influence their dispersal probability into this empty territory here? So in this one here. And yes, it did. So you can see here that the higher the risk, so the highest risk is here with a large predator, the higher the risk, the less fish were dispersing into the empty territory. So in, actually when there was a very large predator in this treatment here, um, only one in only one case dispersal happened, whereas most fish dispersed when there was no predator. The other thing what happened in this experiment is that um, the fish were um, changing their helping behavior. So the higher was the risk again here, the more they were 
oh no, sorry, the higher the risk, so these are the squares um, here, here, and here, the more they were sand digging. And generally, you see also it was um, drawn for three sizes of helpers, and you see that generally large helpers do more in the digging. But the important thing here are is the comparison of the squares to the circle, so high predation risk to low predation risk. Um, so one could understand why the fish want to stay at home, because it is very risky to leave a territory. If a fish leaves a territory, it is at high risk of being eaten. When it is protected by a group, we know that survival is higher. Um, but it is not yes, um, self-evident why the fish should also help. Uh, however, they should do so because helpers can be readily expelled by dominance. So it's not that the dominant wants to maximize the number of helpers, but if a helper is lazy or if uh, there are too many fish around, helpers can be expelled. This is just showing um, that they are more expelled the bigger they get. This is a, an old lab um, study from Michael uh, Taborski's PhD. So the bigger the fish are, the more likely they are expelled. So, and um, this should, of course, influence their behavior in terms of helping. Okay, so um, another question one may ask, well, do they have indirect benefits to this true relatedness? Um, yes, they do, but only when they are very small. So here you have the body length of the helpers and the genetic relatedness to either the female or to the male. And you can see that with body size and with age, relatedness decreases quite strongly. So they actually only the small helpers are related um, to the breeder pair. And the reason for this is because of predation, the breeder pair is exchanged quite often. It is eaten. And then the helpers are still around and the new um, breeder pair, can, uh, the new the, the position is filled either by a member of the same group or by a, 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 an immigrant. And then if that happens, then the, the offspring are not related anymore to the breeder pair. Um, do the benefit, do the dominants have benefits from the helpers being around? Yes, they do. So if um, the helpers are around, which you can test by removal experiments, they have to defend less and um, they have to, uh, to do less brood care. And what uh, that was actually my first study I did in this fish. What we also found is that um, when you have more helpers around, the females are able to lay smaller eggs. So I, we guess that they save energy by that. Okay, um, so far, that is sort of how this helper system is built in these fish. Um, now, these fish do not only have the possibility to um, appease dominance by uh, helping. So we have shown that helping can reduce the aggression by dominance, but they can do this also by social behavior, by social display. And this is, um, this is not a cichlid, but you see very well what I mean by submissive behavior. That means an individual makes itself small. It, it folds the ears, the tail, everything, it makes itself small. And the fish have the same possibility, just it looks slightly different. So what they can do to appease the aggression of dominance by submission is folding the fins and vibrating with the tail or with the entire body, which we call tail quiver. Um, oh yeah, I have another video. Um, so I will show you here, hopefully, how that looks. So now it happens, I will show it again. So the, the dominant fish in this video is going to the shelter and then the small fish here is coming, turning with a tail towards the dominant, folding the fins and perhaps the quality is not good enough that you can see also the tail vibration. I hope I can play it again, yeah. So big fish goes to the shelter. Oh, let's get stuck. Oh, it's stuck. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. So it seems that now the connection is not good enough to play it a second time. 
Yeah, now it works. So now the fish turns around, folds the fins, and yeah, the tail vibration is a bit difficult to see. Okay, so um, as we are talking about social phenotypes, I mentioned before that some animals, some individuals may be able to show more of an appropriate behavioral response. And we are here again talking about submission um, towards um, aggression of a dominant fish. In this particular situation, um, we had two fish. One was the owner of a resource, which is very valuable for our fish. Um, they need shelters in order not to be eaten in the wild. This is of course a lab study where we don't have this direct threat, but they know they need a shelter. Shelter is important. And if you have this asymmetric situation where you make one fish the owner beforehand, and then you, you join it with an intruder, the intruder does not really have a chance to kick this fish out because it is already the owner. It has an advantage. But what this intruder can do, it can attack the owner, which is not a good idea, or it can show submission, and then it is tolerated very closely to this shelter. And you see that we have here two types of fish, uh, the green fish that are more responsive towards this um, aggression of the owner. So they show more submission per received aggression and the blue fish would show less of this aggression, uh, submission. And um, these types, so what we, let's call it for now, the submissive type and the less submissive type can arise through social niche differentiation. And um, so in this situation, we would expect the fish, as I said, to grow up in the same environment. So you would have different a mix of siblings. Some of them show a higher rate of the submission, others don't. So this would be a case of social niche specialization. So um, under which conditions would we expect such niche differentiation to happen? We would expect it when Individuals start, like here depicted, this is an individual, it has three traits, a blue, a green, and a, a yellow trait, and this is another individual. They are starting exactly the same, they look the same, they start with the same body size, same behaviors when they are born, but they have a conflict over resources. And um, through very minor, maybe even random experiences these fish have with each other, they may start to show one behavior more, like here the blue behavior, uh, or another fish starts to show a certain behavior less often. So it start, has a slight difference with its brood mates. Uh, and if that happens, it could be these fish are then in, in different roles. One, let's say, is in the more submissive role, the other one is a more aggressive role. And that reduces conflict between them because they are not exactly the same anymore. And if that is sort of by positive um, enforcement enhanced these differences so that you really get two different social phenotypes, it may happen that you become so different that switching the roles from one day to the next would entail costs and then you stick with your specialization. So this is the idea of the social niche um, hypothesis. So it is a positive feedback on minor differences in behavioral expression that happen at the, at the very earliest stages of life. And here you see um, results from a previous PhD student of mine, Claudia Kasper. And this is um, perhaps the most extreme negative correlation so be between two behaviors I ever found. You can see that in, in a certain situation where a focal fish, this one here, was uh, having the opportunity to, to clean eggs, which were placed in the tank, or to submit to a dominant, which is enclosed in a, in a glass. And if we don't, uh, in a container or in a, it's behind a divider. And if we don't do that, this dominant would eat the eggs because it did not lay these eggs. It's just a dominant fish. So it could sh show egg, the focal can show egg care my cursor is gone, it can correct care, or it can go to this fish and show submission. And you see that it, uh, that these fish really did either or, so they did not both. The fish were either going to this dominant, um, so each point is an individual in the experiment, so 
either going and showing submission or doing a cleaning. So this really took up two different roles in this setup. Um, and what Claudia wanted to know is how these social phenotypes are determined. And one possibility is that it has a genetic basis so that it is heritable. And for that, she did a quite a big uh, breeding design experiment where she, uh, it was a paternal half zip design where she had 39 males and uh, each male was um, mated with two females. And then she scored all these 454 offspring for their behavior to see if um, the behaviors were heritable. And um, she used a similar setup then in this other study I showed you before. So the, the focal fish could clean the eggs or it could submit towards the dominant or it could, uh, or not or, but and it could defend against an egg predator. So she measured three helping behaviors, egg cleaning. She also measured sand digging. So all these tanks have sand available and predator defense and she measured submission. Um, so uh, just to remind you of these four behaviors, which you have seen before, egg cleaning, digging, egg predator defense and submission. Um, so if you, in her results, if you first focus on the green data points, these are the results for the three helping behaviors and the green data point are the repeatability. So you can see that all these behaviors are to some degree repeatable uh, and at least significantly different from zero. And then if you look at the blue data point, you see that we did not find any indication that these behaviors are heritable. So H square was not different from zero. And the same, if you only look here again at the blue part, it's the same um, we found for submission. The only thing we found was actually a significant effect of the particular breeder pair, but heritability was zero in all these behaviors. Uh, also important is that all three behaviors were negatively related to submission. So similar to as this graph I showed you before, helping is obviously negatively related to submission. You do the one or the other. Um, so it seems we have in these broods consistent social phenotypes because we have found repeatability, at least in the helping behavior, we tested this. We have no heritable basis. So these phenotypes must have come about by phenotypic plasticity. And we think that these are really emergent properties among rootmates due to social niche specialization. Um, so why would we find that? So we have egg carers, these are the ones that are doing the work. And we have a submissive type. Um, and as I said before, egg carrying and submission is two ways how a subordinate can appease dominance and to achieve to be tolerated as a territory. So um, we think that um, there is indeed a competitive resource in these fish and this is the access to the territory because if they are evicted from a territory um, and they don't have a place to stay um, in another group, they are eaten in, the, in nature, they would be eaten by predators. Um, and um, the reason why access to the territory is probably limited is that uh, there, are, there is no endless number of egg carers required in a territory. So a female does not need 20 fish to care for her eggs. So um, it is rather, although we have not studied that in the field, because these, small, these very small helpers are um, a bit tricky to catch and mark, they are just too small. But um, we, it is from our observations, it is likely that it is always the same fish that do the egg care. So the number of egg carers is limited. And if it is possible just by being submiss submissive to be allowed to be at a territory, then it is of, of course a wonderful possibility to enhance the, possib uh, the chance to be tolerated by dominance and to stay at the territory. Okay. So the second um, way how we can get social phenotypes is if fish grow up in different environments. 
and then due to the environmental cues, they develop different types. And in this um, case, we would expect that fish growing up in one brood are more of the one behavioral type um, or social phenotype, let's say the more submissive one. And in another brood, they are only, they are less submissive or not submissive at all. And because it is not absolute, there may be some variation, but most of these fish in the second environment may not show this behavior, then we would have an environmental effect. Um, and this was studied by these four people, my former PhD students, Stefan Fischer and Diogo Antunes, who are now both postdocs, and uh, two master students, Evelyn Obermal and Lena Bohm. And um, please, Bear with me, so the next slide contains research of something like five years, but I will try to, to go through it slowly uh, so that you can um, appreciate this. So uh, what these people did is they reared the fish in two social environments. They reared them in a group with parents and helpers to help us, or they reared them without any older fish, so just a brood of siblings. So they were not alone, but they were just with same age uh, siblings together. In fact, this experiment was more complex. Uh, it had actually four treatments also with predator cues, but I only presented two social environments. Um, the first uh, test, whether this treatment, so being reared with a family group or not, had an effect was when the, the young were still in the treatment that was during the first two months. So they got this experience for two months and we measured their spontaneous behavior during these two months. Um, and we found that fish reared with a family group were more submissive than the others. Then we gave them a month of break uh, where everybody was kept in the same conditions because we wanted to know whether the early social environment also affects the behavior after everybody had been in, in standard conditions, so not a direct effect of the early life treatment. And this, um, these fish were tested at an age of five months. And here we tested whether they are um, better integrated in a novel family group, so a new pair of fish that they have not met before. And again, we found that fish that were reared with a family group in this situation were more submissive and as a consequence, they were also better tolerated in this group than these fish that reared, were reared without parents. Um, but <clears throat> the second thing we were interested in, what is about the helping behavior? Because we had these two types, Icarus and submissive fish. And um, so we gave them eggs to care at an age of 10 months. And here, our fish that were reared without a family group had um, a higher frequency of doing this egg care than this, uh, this blue group here. So obviously here's already an indication of that we have um, a specialization into two roles. Then we wanted to know whether this is also uh, related to their um, life history trajectories or in particular to their dispersal. And we found that these fish that were read alone and were doing the more of this egg care were the ones in a tank experiment again uh, that were more likely to disperse into a second territory where a mating partner was provided for them. Whereas these fish here, the ones reared with family, they rather stayed in the group, in this group here. No, it was, uh, in, in a group we provided to them. And last not least, um, we wanted to know if that also affects their reproductive traits. And remarkably, yes, that was the case. So fish that um, stayed and help when you give them the opportunity to mate. So when you put them together with a mating partner of the same rearing environment in this case, in after, at an age of four years, they laid larger and more eggs than this green group here. So we have effects on behavior, life history, um, in, with respect to several traits. Um, 
So the next question uh, Diogo Antonis wanted to know is if we have this effect on X, do, is, are the behavioral phenotypes um, non-genetically transmitted to the next generation? Um, for example, through substances that are put in the X. And for such non-genetic inheritance to occur, it re requires that these fish live in a variable, but in a predictable environment. Uh, there are many studies on um, non-genetic inheritance where people don't know the situation in the field. So do, do the, the study species really match these requirements that are necessary for such non-genetic inheritance to occur? Um, so these um, conditions are here summarized in a nice sketch. So you can say if the environment is very uncertain, so here, and cues of the environment are informative, then you would expect plasticity, and this is the same is true for transgenerational plasticity. Uh, so luckily we know the situation in, in our fish from the field quite well, and we know that both predation risk on a local basis, food and group size, all these, um, um, traits uh, or these factors vary in time within populations. Um, but we also know that, as I showed right at the beginning, the social environment of these fish is um, predictable because the group size is correlated across years. So they can make some prediction about their future. And um, also risk, the risk to be predated, predated by um, these large predators can be predicted from the own group size and from the distance to the neighboring group sizes. So we know that these two factors together determine how safe a fish is from predation or not, because groups, also neighboring groups, sort of defend commonly against when, when a predator is coming by. And um, so this has been uh, shown by a previous um, PhD student of Michael in the field. <coughs> so what... Um, Yogo now did to test for non-genetic inheritance is that he did a cross-fostering experiment. So this is our F0 generation and I introduced it to you. These are the fish that were reared. Uh, I just realized their colors are now different. So these are the fish that were reared um, with the family group and these were the fish that were reared just um, as um, with their siblings. And when they were adults, we formed pairs of these fish and let them produce eggs. And then we let these eggs either be reared by foster parents or just in a bucket of water, so without any social stimulation. And that gave rise to four treatments. So we had a treatment group. The first sign is always referring to the um, treatment of the parents. So the parents were reared with um, adult fish and the offspring were reared with adult fish. Parents were reared with adult fish, offspring were reared um, without parents and so on. So we had these four treatments and um, tested them when they were big enough for that <clears throat> age of few months in a asymmetric competition test as I introduced it before. Uh, one fish is the owner, this is just the opponent, and we are interested in this fish here, in the intruder, and how much submission it will show towards the owner. Um, and we found nicely an effect of the parental generation here, so it's the first sign here, that determined whether or not, some fish really did not show any submission, whether or not the fish was showing submission. So the parental experience determines sort of the propensity to show submission. Here it is higher, here it is lower. And these are the fish that are where the parents were growing, growing up alone. So it seems that this social behavior type is indeed um, inherited to the offspring. Um, why would we have this specialization between social environments? This is a bit of a tricky question. As we, uh, it is difficult to, as, as you know, in the in the lab to measure fitness, but there are at least um, three hypotheses 
to explain this. One thing is that it could be that uh, specialization into social types um, helps you to cope with current conditions, or it could help you to cope with future conditions, which is then called predictive adaptive response, or it could simply be a carryover or silver spoon effect of, um, of a good environment the mother ex uh, the parents experience. And we think that both of these first two possibilities may apply in our fish. So one reason is that um, fish that grow up uh, with a family grow up in a safer environment. So this may make them to choose a staying um, a phenotype. However, also when you grow up uh, in a, uh, with parents, it signals a higher population density. And for this, I have to explain that we have another experiment where we did the same experiment, or not, not the full range, but a similar experiment with large and small groups. And it, it, we, a large group reflects what we find in this plus F fish and a small group reflects what we find in, in this minus F conditions or in the, fish, in the condition without parents. So if you grow up in a large group, it could reflect that you are in a higher density and you have to, to prepare for future competition. And um, if you remember also our, our fish that grew up with parents, our plus F fish were more socially competent. They were more able to show this submissive behavior and they were more philopatric. And um, so the benefit of having this higher social competence could allow them maybe to stay in the natal territory and to inherit this territory sooner or later, which yields higher fitness uh, in, in the field. So that was also shown in the field study that if you stay at home and inherit the care territory, you have a higher fitness than if you disperse and breed somewhere else. But this is of course uh, still under debate, um, which of these benefits are more important and if both of them apply. <clears throat> Um, at, uh, at last, I wanted to show very briefly uh, what we think, which mechanisms may underlie the social phenotypes in our fish. And um, this is a study that was done with my previous PhD student, Cecilia Niemann, and my long year collaborator, Nadja Obinhold. Um, and I'm lucky that last year, uh, last week, Dustin Rubenstein introduced to you the glucocorticoid receptor already. And uh, in several studies, also in, in the one I'm showing here, uh, we found indications that these rearing environments are being reared with a family group or without influences the expression of the glucocorticoid receptor one, which is actually the same that is also um, the GR that is present in birds and mammals. So it is homolog to this, to the GR. And we have several other studies showing that the stress axis is responding differently, that they have a different cortisol baseline and so on. But what I want to show you here is a study, a, a separate study, a second experiment of Cecilia showing that this gene or this receptor or the, let's say the receptor that is coded for by this gene is really causally involved in the social behavior. And for this, she did a pharmacological experiment where she blocked this GR receptor. And I should say that this receptor is involved in the stress regulation and it binds cortisol and this binding of the cortisol gives a signal to the brain uh, that, um, the stress response is terminated. So it, it, it blocks the further production of cortisol, which is the most important stress hormone in fish. Um, and I should also say that this result here was in the brain. So we, in this case, we can really take the brain and it was only in the forebrain. And this is also the region where we expected the GR1 to be differently expressed, where we found this difference. Okay. so. What did Cecilia find when she blocked this receptor? She did it actually by adding a substance which is called RU486, also called mifepristone. And in this fish, she applied it systemically by bathing them. So for a 
these were adult normal raised fish and she put them for some time in this bath and um, we had to control solution and then afterwards the fish were tested again in the isometric competition test I have shown earlier. Again we focused on the intruder because we were interested if the submission of this behavior of this intruder changes. And what she found is in the fish uh, that had undergone this treatment that they, if you want, become more socially competent. So they showed more submission in this situation towards the owner uh, relative to, to the owner's aggression. The control fish actually have a flat response in this experiment. But interestingly, although they, or well, not although, but probably because they showed more submission, they were less attacked by the owner. Uh, so here you have the treated fish, they were less attacked, but nevertheless, they were winning more often, which is quite unusual in this asymmetric situation. So in the control situation, only one, um, one of these intruder fish that have a disadvantage in this situation could win the shelter, but when they were treated with this substance, there were many significantly more winner, uh, fish winning this resource. So although they were more submissive in the end, they gained the resource. Um, so to come to my conclusions, which are actually quite short. So we have social phenotypes in Neolampologus pulcher. They are determined by developmental plasticity and they can be um, come about by social niche specialization, as I explained in the first part of my talk, or they can come about by the fish being raised in different environments. Um, the social niche specialization may allow more fish to stay in a territory. And um, this uh, environment, early environment effects may help these fish to prepare either for the current or for the future conditions. And I think uh, that in, in uh, these two sort of kind of specializations occur together. So in, in each of these different environments of fish is reared, you can still then find little specialization among the broodmates. Um, such um, specializations to social phenotypes can be transmitted non-genetically to the next generation. And finally, it seems that the stress axis receptor GR or GR1 is causally involved in this specialization. Okay, so I would like to thank all my uh, collaborators in this work. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I think I stop sharing, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, great. Thank you very much, Barbara. That's an amazing talk. It's always so cool to say, to see what experiments can be done with these fish, both in captivity and in the field. And just to let everybody know if no one can do experiments, it's not easy to do it and to make it work. I mean, I worked myself at the very beginning of my career with Schichlitz. It's nice what one can do there, but one still has to plan these experiments very carefully and make sure it works. So um, shortly to um, repeat for everyone, if you have a question here in the Zoom meeting, then please type a question mark into the chat. I will then call upon you and then when I call your name, please, even though we might know you by now, um, quickly introduce yourself, say what is your name and where you're coming from, what you're working at. If you're on YouTube, you can um, write their questions into the chat function. And when they're related to the talk, I will also um, bring them up here in the Zoom meeting. I saw there's already one question very early that it's about cuckoos. And maybe that's because I said Barbara did her postdoc with cuckoos. But I will uh, wait for this um, very unusual question um, until all the fish questions have been have been asked. So the first question comes from Laura, please. Hi, uh, it was really good, a nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a student at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, I'm a master students, uh, and I was wondering, <clears throat> uh, the fish without family groups, how? Uh, is the situation in the field for them? Are there many fish that are reared without family groups and or not? And I was wondering if it is 
really better uh, for them to be uh, less uh, submissive or they just don't have the chance to learn how to be submissive because there's no one to be submissive to? Yeah, that's, that are both good questions. The first question is, of course, I get it in every paper for the referees. Um, um, and with the second question, yeah, you have maybe to remind me then. Um, so, um, no, in the field, they don't grow up with our family groups. And that's why I mentioned that we did the same, which we call our validation study, actually. We did the same study with large and small groups. So um, in the field, they have this enormous group variation between one helper and 20 helpers. And in the, in the lab, we did a study with either one helper or eight helpers. And that brings about similar differences. So simply speaking, you could say, OK, the one is growing up in a more complex social environment than the other. Yeah? Yeah. And that would explain why they want it is really very simplified, but that's why the ones are more socially competent that grow up in the more complex environment. Yeah. Um, there is also a similar hypothesis out in cleaner fish. So Ray Ramshari is also became interested in social competence. And he said, for example, that the cleaner fish that have 2000 interactions per day are more socially competent than the ones that live on a slightly destroyed reef where they have only 800. It still sounds a lot, but it makes a difference. So it could be, and it, it's actually closely related also at this point to your second um, part of the question. So um, what I think what is going on in these fish, why some show less submission is really that as you, as you were suspecting that they have a low opportunity to learn this. So what we observed is when they are growing up with a family, um, they show more peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So they don't interact, they don't learn it from the parents. I, I really don't believe that because we are talking about larvae that are one centimeter size. So, I, uh, but they have more interactions with these other, other fry. Um, and I think that it is really learning by doing in these fish because also in one experiment where I observed the, um, these two types of fish, uh, I saw that some of these fish that grew out up without families did not only show less submission, but they also had a not so nice fluent movement of the tail quiver. So they, I think they, they were even motorically not so good in showing this behavior. So it could, a lot of that could, the social competence could really be learned very early on by opportunity with the interaction with the other small fish. That's what I think could happen. But nevertheless, afterwards, they have these small benefits from that ability um, in all kinds of interactions, not only in the asymmetric competition test. We also tested them in group integration. We tested them in, uh, um, in, a, in a symmetric situation in, in, in all kinds of these tests. They have small but frequent benefits because they are socially interacting so often if you have a, a slightly better performance in each interaction of, of, the, of 100 interactions you have a day, that accumulates to, to some fitness benefits in the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes by Adam Redon, please. Uh, great talk, Barbara. I really enjoyed it. My, um, Hi, my name. <laughs> My name is uh, Adam Redden. I'm a senior lecturer in behavioral ecology at Liverpool John Moores University, and I study the uh, mechanisms and functions of cooperation and conflict in cooperatively breeding cichlids. Um, I have a few questions, but maybe I'll just restrain myself to one and, and put myself at the back of the queue afterwards. Um, so when you're explaining the, the submissive displays, you sort of focused on this quivering, be tail quivering behavior. Um, but these fish also show these sort of head up submissive postures where they kind of tilt their head up in the, in the water axis and kind of face out their ventral surface at the receiving animal. Um, and these sort of co-occur with the quivers or not. And, and you know, it's probably interesting when they do or don't co-occur, but I was just curious a bit how you uh, accounted for that behavior also and whether you scored those sort of in the same way or you, you didn't count them or you, you know, just how you treated that 
that um, kind of head up it, posture. Yeah, that's true. Um, <clears throat> actually, what I did not say is that this, um, what we call aggression or submission, well, we, have, we usually have three categories of behavior, restraint, aggression, over aggression, and submission, and they contain different behaviors. So I showed the tail quiver because it is the most um, illustrative and the most well-known submissive behavior, but our category of, when I talk about submissive behavior, it contains all submissive behaviors, also head-ups. Okay, great, thank yeah. you. So we, you know, we have this etogram with these 25 behaviors or so, or even more. And also for restraint integration, it is consisting of, of at least six or seven different behaviors um, of different intensity. So we group them in order to be able to, to analyze them statistically. Otherwise we would have too low count. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So the next question is by Peter Kappeler. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Thanks Peter. for a, a really nice talk. Uh, this is Peter Kappler from the German Primate Center in Göttingen. Uh, I have a question about your social competence framework, mm. which is really appealing, but also intriguing in, in one key aspect, and maybe I'm missing something, because it all appears to hinge on the definition of what is an appropriate and an mm -hmm. inappropriate response. And this seems to have some, you know, subjective flavor. And so in these fish, which you know very well, you know, mm -hmm. you may be in a position to really define what is, or, or explain or justify what's appropriate or inappropriate. But still, I mean, you get variation among the individuals. And, and so I was, you know, wondering, how can you define what is appropriate and mm. inappropriate without introducing circularity? Yeah, I, I, I know, I know this, <laughs> this point. Um, so it is indeed so that I think you need a very good species ahead of you start, before you start to, to measure it, you need a very good species knowledge. And um, so we, um, over the years of, of working with these fish, we have learned that, that certain responses um, make you being tolerant and certain responses make you being e evicted. I, it, I think it is problem, problematic if you don't know a, a lot about your species to make these predictions. Um, of course, we have variation, but um, at, at which you also saw my plots, you, you saw the variation. Uh, for this particular study I'm doing, I'm comparing these two, two conditions where the fish grow up. So it's, I'm still comparing, in a way, a, a slope or a mean response. Yeah? And I can still say that, for example, the responsiveness of this, what we call appropriate behavior, um, is steeper in the one group than in the other. I was not analyzing the variation around these lines. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I would be happy if you have an opinion about that. But in principle, it is really that we, before we did this, so, so you cannot post hoc say, okay, this fish has a better outcome of a certain situation and therefore it was social competent and thereby we define social competence because then it becomes really circular. But yeah. um, if you have a good species knowledge and you know the outcomes from thousands and thousands of interactions you have seen in this fish and you know there are these are simplified outcomes. You can show submission or you can attack or you can flee, which is also not a good idea. So if you know these outcomes, um, then you know which of one is the appropriate one from the species knowledge. That is how I can, how I can answer this. Uh, I don't know what, what your take on this. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm, I'm just puzzled. I mean, even in this simple experiment, you know, you can say, well, it's obviously, appropriate to avoid aggression because it has its benefits. But since these fish are competing over the flower pot, so it might also be important to be the owner of the flower pot. And so attacking it, it, yeah, but to as, as displace yeah. the other one may also be an appropriate response that in the long run yeah, okay. fitness okay. benefits. That's true. I mean, in this last experiment where we gave them the substance, exactly that happened. 
and so I would call it the super competence issue. No, but I, I think in the normal situation, when you don't give them this uh, mifepristone, there were no takeovers taking place, or perhaps there was one takeover taking place. Yeah, so it was not statistically really relevant. So the two options the fish has is submitting or fleeing. And if it flees, the other one just goes after it and kicks it out. And if it submits, it is tolerated in within three centimeters of this flower pot. So if a predator would come, it could still sort of move into this shelter. This is now specific to this situation, yeah. But but mm -hmm. we did not in 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 the, in the in the normal situation I showed you before between this plus f and minus f fish, we did not see takeovers ha happening often enough to analyze them. Of course, that is also an op op a possibility to be successful. Yeah? But in this situation, they could either show the display or run away, and running away was leads to eviction. Yeah, but presumably there are many situations where you know you have a choice and and two responses which are possible, and then it, I think it gets tricky to mm. label them as appropriate or inappropriate. Yeah, I mean the this 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 knowledge we have from the fish before we did this experiment, of course, also. In, we know the outcome, yeah? So otherwise we could not say what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, maybe others have thoughts or other examples in mind. So I don't want to monopolize the discussion here. Hope to, to see you soon in another context where we can yeah, it, it, it's an important discussion. I mean, it is it is not entirely solved, but it is. Um, yeah, that that that's how we define appropriate. This is really from from knowing the possible uh, the yeah from the species knowledge, as I just said. Mm -hmm. This is how we did it. Perhaps there is a, another way one can. I don't know. Think of some. No, I know it's artificial intelligence, but some other uh, measures, but this was our current approach. Yeah. It is certainly important to, to continue thinking about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Then the next question comes by Suleyma Tang Martinez. Yes, hi, um, Suleyma Tang Martinez. Um, University of Missouri, St. Louis in the United States. I'm now retired, and I have um, two questions which hopefully will be brief. The first one, well, first of all, I wanna say thank you for a really, really fascinating talk on a fascinating topic. But uh, the first question I have is, how did you, um, how did you measure uh, dispersal or what constituted dispersal in the experiment where you had the large underwater enclosures, because mm -hmm. I'm assuming that because they were enclosure, ah. the fish would not be able to swim out of there, right? In this underwater um, dispersal experiment, they had, there was an empty territory and they dispersed into the empty territory. So okay. they, they, of course, they could not go out of the cage, no, but they had, there were three territories with three family groups and one was empty and we wanted, to, or, it was not done, but it was done by okay. Okay, they yeah, wanted to see it. if they, but yeah, but yeah, but the predator still had access to that empty territory where they dispersed, correct or not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yes, and that is um, the reason why there was so little disposal because that is a rich, a risky decision to take. Okay, to so, yeah, because they don't disperse with 20 fish, yeah, there's then there would be two or three dispersing and then they are at higher risk. Okay, great. And then the, the second question is in, in the fascinating ex experiment that you did where you had um, fish that were reared without the breeders and fish that were, were uh, reared with breeders. <clears throat> and then you demonstrated, you saw all the differences in behavior and so on. Um, and life history. I'm wondering, did you 
try or do you have any predictions as to what might happen if you had, for example, fish reared with, uh, not with, uh, without the breeders, but in large groups versus small groups mm -hmm. and fish reared with breeders in large groups versus small groups. And you might have alluded to this, but I wasn't sure. And so I just wanted to check and, and yeah, ask. I mean, I I did not have a prediction what happens in a large and small group without breeders, because normally a, a group has breeders and it has this, this really nice, I mean, you can, you have almost constant size differences, we have a range, but we did a study where we wanted to know because it's more natural to compare large and small groups than fish with and without breeders, because in nature they, they don't occur without breeders for obvious reasons, because the young are uh, eaten then immediately. And we find the similar responses. Um, this is now actually also done by, by two ongoing PhD students. They both work with large and small groups. And we find similar responses between large and small groups and with and without breeders. That's why I said, I think it is a social complexity. So it's which makes them um, being more responsive to, um, to aggression, also to have the stronger response of submission when they are attacked. In, in, when they are growing up in a more socially complex environment, from the from this study, yeah, actually there were also inter differences in spontaneous behavior. Yeah, so it is also while being in a large and a small group, they probably have the same issue that they learn better among peers when they are with many fish that guard them, as compared to only three fish, uh, which re reflects the situation. Uh, we had in the experiments I showed where they had either no garter or only two garters or, or three garters. Yeah. So I think it's really a lot about safety and being growing up in a safe environment and then trying out things with other larvae, uh, with other fry and learning the behaviors. Mm. Yeah, because it also seems that if you have um, fish being reared without the breeders, that they're less likely to encounter situations where they either, you know, they challenge because there, there's no breeders to challenge um, or to intrude upon. And so they would have, let, I mean, this, this is not in any way negate what you just said, mm -hmm. but I'm just thinking in terms of opportunities for even showing the behavior. If you're raised with breeders, there might be more experience of having to submit to those breeders um, and more, there's more of a payoff if you want um, from some more of a benefit from submitting because you are interacting with breeders. Well, if you're with your peer group and no <clears throat> breeders, there might be less opportunities to um, either experience aggression or to have to submit. Mm -hmm. That makes it, sense to you? It may, it might be, but it is actually not the case. So the okay. thing when these when these fish are fry, they have very little interactions with big fish. So it's it's like in two different okay. worlds. Why I think it's really more the safety aspect. So, but they have these interactions with the peers, but nevertheless, the fish that had the garters there, or they had more garters there, showed more interactions with the peers, which I call learning by doing, yeah? <laughs> yeah. and the others. So it is, it's actually, it's, it's not that they observe the adults or that they really submit to them when they are very, very small. And these two months of experience we give them, we are still talking about this very small, of this swarm of, of young. They are not really like individually submitting to the adults or something. That is, that comes okay. later. That comes when they are two or three centimeters or so, yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Hola, then we have the next question by Baptiste Sadushi, please. Good evening, thank you very much for your, your talk. Um, I'm Baptiste, a PhD student in the Behavioral Ecology Lab at the University of Göttingen. Um, I just had a question on the very striking dichotomy um, between helping uh, clean the eggs and submission mm -hmm. that you showed on this, uh, mm, yeah. this graph. Yeah. And I was simply wondering, do you already have a hint on the maybe um, genetic 
antagonist effects that are like constraining those response. And given that you presented at the end the effect of the GEC receptor, um, blocking the GC receptor on submissive behavior, did you maybe see that it increases uh, the tendency to clean eggs or not, which would suggest that there is another uh, genetic uh, mechanism linking those two um, yeah, that would strategies. Be cool, right? yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, that would be good if we knew that, but um, the egg cleaning task is, is a very difficult one to do. That's why not many people have done it so far. Um, the thing is you have to make first a fish submissive to a big fish and you want to have it in a, you want to do that for let's say two weeks and then you want to have eggs and you have to put the eggs into the tank and that is often not the case and that leads to a lot of frustration so we have done the egg cleaning task only two times and um, so we, we I would love to know whether it is also linked to this GR receptor I would love to, to know whether it is linked to the stress axis at all. Um, but for this, so we we did a lot on the behavior side now and silently assume that they have, that the ones that show more submission show less egg cleaning. But of course, from the genetic side, I, I just cannot tell you now. So maybe in the future, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's not yet done. <laughs> that would be exciting to see. It would be super, super exciting. Yes, I agree. I fully agree. Then we have a question by Anja Günther. Yes, this is Anja Günther. Uh, I'm a group leader for behavioral ecology at the Max Planck Institute in Plön in Germany. Uh, Barbara, first, thanks of all for the wonderful talk. It's always, uh, I always very much enjoy listening to your new results. I was wondering um, in the uh, experiment where you let fish grow up in different environments and then they produce differently sized eggs in the end. Mm -hmm. So is that, uh, is that just a reflection of a constraint? So do, uh, is, are, are these fish in poorer conditions? Do they show smaller growth rates or something? Or is it really a shift in the quality quantity life history trade-off? And if so, do you have any ideas if it also um, carries over to other life history trade-offs. Yeah, so we searched for any indications that these fish are smaller or grew less or have a lower body condition. We, there was nothing going on there, actually. Um, um, it was also, it, it is, yeah, we have all these no's. There's also no difference in the interval between the broods, so you could expect that they have smaller eggs, but then they lay more often, so that was also not the case. Um, we also counted the eggs, <laughs> and there was no uh, size number trade-off. At least it could also be because it's maybe had three broods, and we counted all these eggs. It could also be, uh, and and the sample size is not huge. It can also be that we just overlooked something. But there was also another experiment where the fish changed the egg size, which I showed briefly. That if you have a larger group size the fish produced smaller eggs. And also there, we did not find this trade-off. Find this trade-off. So what we thought is, it's, it's, it's the only other possibility that they may, would have more broods in their life, that they would live longer, which we did not study in both of these experiments because these live can, fish can live up to 10 years. Uh, so we cannot do their lifetime reproductive success in the lab. <laughs> and we don't, uh, I mean, I could perhaps do it, but <laughs> not the students. And um, so uh, it is a bit difficult. So we have not really hard uh, evidence for all these trade-offs. Yeah, oh, actually we have no evidence for all these trade-offs. So we were of course thinking what could be the, the reason and our explanation is still that it is about how their fish perceives the environment that the minus F fish perceives the environment as being unsecure. And perhaps therefore they don't put so much in a single egg um, no, not, I was, I was wrong. They like fewer eggs and smaller eggs. So that was the point. It was, the egg, we, we counted the eggs and that fewer eggs and smaller eggs. So it is the opposite of this trade-off. But nevertheless, let's talk about egg size. <laughs> it could be that they just invest less in egg size because they, they think this environment is, is insecure. But it is, it's speculation. I mean, I, especially because you have, um, a less reproductive total investment, you have smaller eggs and fewer eggs. 
something must uh, I think it's a strategy and I think it has to be it must have uh, to be linked to this early environment. I should also say that it is for each of these steps in this graph that was unfolding, we use different siblings. So it is not a accumulative effect of all the experiences that before, but we kept these fish really in, in stock tanks and took them out for the particular tests. So now I have a student that really looks at the pro and the individual profiles of the fish. But at that stage, it was really, it was the siblings were our replicates and they were all naive. So it must be something that happened really in the first two months of life, which changed their strategy uh, of reproductive investment later on. Very cool. Thanks. Welcome. Then the next question comes by Ching Yu Kui. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for the excellent talks. Um, I'm, I'm Jing Yu from the University of, I'm a Master two student from the University of Strasbourg. I'm currently working with Karsten on the evolution of marsupial social organizations. Uh, so, uh, so I know there, so there's a lot of social cichlid in the Lake Tanganyika. So I'm, I'm wondering that this plastic, so, uh, plastic social phenotypes, uh, does it exist in other social fish or is it only observed in this species? Hmm. Well, <laughs> from my knowledge, it, it has not been studied in other cichlids, but perhaps Adam and Michael can correct me, but um, I, I'm only aware of, of this one species because there it was studied. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's too bad, actually. Because, because I had, because uh, I've, I had with some of the some of the social fish and I never observed such behavior. Mm -hmm. so. You had some, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, um, but maybe you could also rear them in different social environments and then see if they, if these types emerge by that. I mean, of course, I had, we had the social niche stuff, which, which happens within the brood, the social niche specialization, but you could to, to enforce this, I mean, I found the types first in the two different environments. So you could rear them in two different social environments and see if they start to develop social phenotypes. That would be a nice comparative project. <laughs> if you still have them. Yeah, I still have them. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, Chinyu has Neolamprologus multifasciatus at home. So yeah. The species I studied for my Diploma thesis. So, yeah, we so have, it's also a highly social species. So, it could we have be one small an tank with this system. <laughs> but we never studied them. They're just there as a hobby. <laughs> so, we have them too. They're very cute. Then we have another question by Adam. Hi. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think anyone's looked at um, this kind of social phenotype stuff. At least not in not in anywhere near the kind of you know depth and, and precision that you've you've done with the with the pulcher. Um, but yeah, it certainly would be a good thing to do. Maybe with Julie's or something like that, where you have uh, facultative cooperative breeding, it might be interesting to see how mm -hmm, being raised mm -hmm, in a, yep. a cooperatively breeding group versus just yep. um, by parents might have it, have differences. Um, anyway, I was going to ask, so all your, your work that you presented anyway, that uh, focuses um, on the sort of developmental environment, but I was just curious mm -hmm. whether you'd thought much or, or, or looked at how the <clears throat> sort of current environment might also potentially affect these phenotypes and whether or not you think there's kind of retained plasticity um, later on into life, like can these fish sort of switch from being submitters to helpers mm -hmm. if, the, if the environmental or social conditions sort of change dramatically? Uh, mm. throughout their lives for, for one mm. reason or another. Yeah, that's that's also a very good question, which I may be able to tell you in one and a half years. Um, because my my student, Ocean, she's um, La, Ocean La Loja, she's um, doing exactly that. Well, it's again about developmental plasticity, but if there is a second plasticity window, um, which, as you may be aware, has been found in, in some mammals and birds that they have around adolescence, they have a second um, 
way to reorganize the brain even and to um, to also reorganize the, the um, behavioral phenotype. And so she's rearing them into conditions and makes the factorial design. And then um, when they around sexual maturity, she's putting them into an opposite condition. So either in, in a big group or being entirely alone. And then even later she will test whether um, these different experiences are sort of accumulate, uh, uh, additive or interactive, or if only one of the phases in influences the behavior. But I, we don't have the results yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've been looking a bit at how changing the sort of physical environment that, that groups are living within um, can affect social interactions within the groups, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of, I guess, coming at a, a related question from a different perspective, but um, yeah, it's definitely and, something and we're interested does, in too. It, it does change it. Yeah, so it changes the uh, amount of submissive behavior that you see from the animals. So, okay. um, without kind of giving too much away of what, what we've been working <laughs> on, um, <laughs> giving them sort of a greater opportunity to kind of flee and hide obviously sort of decreases the amount of their likelihood to show submission. Mm -hmm. So it's it's mm -hmm. sort of contextual on the you know not just on the social environment but on the sort of characteristics of the physical environment too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> then, then I have some questions and I must apologize. Maybe you addressed it during your talk, at least partly, and I was too distracted by checking that um, it works on YouTube and so on. Um, it's about this corporate, uh, cooperative breeding and this dichotomy. You have these um, egg carrying, poorly integrated fish created and the submissive, well integrated fish. And I would like to better understand these two types of behavior. So the one question is, is egg carrying when they eat fungus from um, these eggs? Obviously, it's of benefit that the eggs are, more of these eggs are, are surviving. But is it really costly or might it actually be beneficial to have some kind of food from these fungi? And second, what at all, because I mean, this behavior is of benefit for the breeders, what benefit would the breeders have from fish showing submissive behavior? Is it, I mean, I, I think you said that also with predator um, defense, it correlates negatively. So it's not like a shivering fish indicates if there's a predator coming, I'm really going to, to punch him. So what, what is there any thing that, I mean, I would think that the breeders should prefer the egg cleaners than the, yeah, what you the other fish. Yeah. Um, so about the benefit, I, I could imagine they have small energetic benefits. I, I agree, especially as they also eat rotten eggs. So they pick on, on bad eggs. So that is of course still energetic and has some energy, energy content. And now and then they also eat a, a fresh egg, although they do it somehow secretly. <laughs> so. <laughs> There was, uh, it's just anecdotal that this uh, helper was caught in the act and then he started to submit like hell because he, the eggs were still coming out of his gills. <laughs> so that was uh, obviously a very big uh, energetic benefit. Um, um, why parents may tolerate fish that are not helping so much is on the one hand, so the three behaviors I showed you were digging, egg cleaning and uh, uh, defense against egg predators. But what we did not measure in this experiment, unfortunately, is defense against um, these fish predators, the big ones. So everybody more or less contributes a little bit to that if it's big enough. And also we have fish that really are in the core of a territory. And these are probably also the ones that have access to the breeding shelter for egg cleaning. And we have if it's a big group, we have fish that are hanging around more or less. They are tolerated, by, but they're just there. And so they probably do not impose big costs to the bear, but they could still help in terms of dilution effect. So if a predator is coming, they could be eaten because they are at the, out, at the outer part of the territory. And so the predator, if the predator comes from outside, they may just be a good prey. So perhaps if the parents are happy as long as a fish is submitting. And uh, we also have evidence that a fish that is very submissive has 
lower testosterone, so there may not be a big danger in terms of um, stealing fertilizations. So if a submissive fish is just showing, look, I'm just here, I'm, I'm, I'm a good guy, I'm, I'm submitting, and I'm not doing any harm, that they just accept them because they, they could help for this, what I call dilution effect when, when there are predatory attacks. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it means no. <laughs> in this cooperative breeder, the non-helping helpers are better integrated than the, the real yeah. helpers, which is still Yeah, surprising. they are better integrated. That's, that's true. And I, I thought that they are better integrated because they are better to, so, to sense the right social signals. But that does not mean that there are a lot of, that they are really helping, at least not with with these three behaviors we, we studied in this genetic um, inherit, uh, in the um, breeding design study. Yeah? It's difficult to understand, for defense, but- I think, defense, not, I think for defense against um, an, uh, a fish predator, we also had a, a master thesis who had that, and I think there were 90% of the fish contributing. So that is almost everybody was contributing. And okay. that is of course, a a great benefit if, if you have defenders against these fish creators. Yeah, interesting. Sometimes in humans also have the feeling the more social, better integrated people are less helpful. So maybe there's a correlation um, with the fish. You don't expect me to comment on that. <laughs> no, that was just a pointless comment I should delete from, from YouTube later. Okay, um, the next question comes by Marlene, please. Yeah, hello. Thanks for your talk. Um, yeah, I'm Alina. I work um, as a PhD student on individual differences at the University of Münster. And um, I also um, was wondering about the clear distinction between the uh, submissive type and the air cleaning type. And um, it gave the impression with as if um, the air cleaning is a coping yeah, strategy to be accepted by a group when individuals are not submissive. And um, yeah, I wondered whether um, there's um, an advantage of not being submissive in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do the um, not submissive individuals, um, yeah, are they more likely to become a breeding pair? Or is it correlated with, with size or something like this? Um, so if, uh, where shall I start? So, um, well, let, let's start at the end of the question: whether they are more likely to become a breeder pair. If if we have if if you have the types as a phantom, so we have a helper type that disperses, this fish is less likely to be successful because, as as I said, the dispersers have at least a lower, I have a lower fitness, either because they have a lower chance to. Um, to make it to disperse and to have their own group or also because they are in, in groups of poor quality. So they have a lower fitness. So it's not, it's, 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 for me, it's, it's rather the, the poor, the uh, 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 poorer strategy. It's not a, why then not everybody is submissive? Um, when one reason is a social niche specialization, which I talked at, at the beginning, though, so if everybody does the same thing, it could be that that the parents still start to, to kick out fish, so the more fish can stay if they diversify. Um, and what was what was the other part of the of the question? Can you? So um, I think diversification is is a is is as the social niche part shows is a, is obviously a a benefit in itself. Not to that not that everybody does the same. Fitness consequences are different, probably. So what was the second part? Yeah, I was wondering whether um, the air cleaning is um, a coping strategy when coping it was are not ah. submissive. So where does it start? Or is there um, an, an advantage of choosing choosing the um, not being submissive and then becoming more the air cleaner? Yeah. Yeah, if this... I, I, I mean, especially for this... Um, when it, it, it's within the brood, so it, we cannot claim that there are environmental cues and they interpret the environment differently. So that is really hard to say why one chooses this two type or the other, because it happens and we found it afterwards. Um, both types 
of coping strategies to cope with aggression. So a fish that helps more receives less aggression and a fish that submits more. But why one is choosing the one and one, and one is uh, choosing the other in this situation where they diversify within the brood, I cannot tell you. Um, I, I would love to know. Thank you. Good, then we have a question by Eduardo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Barbara, for a wonderful, wonderful talk, engaging, so clear. It's been a lot of fun. And of course, you have developed an impressive system. Yeah, I'm Eduardo Ferranz Duque from Yale University. And now the pure living primates that I study are nothing like working with cyclic fish in terms of the things we can do. I need help in making sure that I go home with a clear understanding of two sets of data that are, are speaking to the same issue of plasticity or not, and, and egg cleaning and submission. If I remember well, you, you made that interesting comment that you had never seen such a negative correlation. You were showing us early in the talk, there was this slide where you explained that each of the green dots was an individual and it was a, an all or none pattern of response from the individuals. They either cleaned or were submissive. So that was those were data points speaking of an individual. But, in that situation, yeah, which right. I, it but then in the, this beautiful five-year experiment you did, if I remember well, then you showed us the percentage of individuals who were submissive or not on various conditions. And those percentages, I was trying to reconcile how you could get those percentages and at the same time have individuals that do it all or none. Yeah, because that's why. Yeah, yeah, that's why it, I said it was in this specific. Have you replicated? Has the study? I mean, we seldom have this kind of results. Yeah, like yeah. You, said, you it, have knowledge. It, I mean, it was really weird uh, <laughs> when I plotted it. I did not believe it myself, but um, it, it's um, it's maybe really in 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 this particular experimental situation where the dominant was behind the partition, so. In, if you remember, I had a pot with eggs and we had a dominant and the dominant was behind the partition so that it could not interfere with the experiment, but it was made dominant, uh, the, the, the focal fish was made subordinate before. So this focal fish could either see the eggs or it could see the dominant. So it had to move actively to the dominant to submit to it. Whereas in, an, in a normal situation, everything would, would uh, swim around. <laughs> and in this particular experiment, because the eggs were not from this dominant fish, we had to put it away because otherwise it would sort of interfere. And we placed the pot so that the fish could either see the eggs or it had to swim out of the pot and it had to, and, and I think it did either or, but it is really owing to this particular, I don't want to say that in the field or so that the fish are either only submitting all the time or only cleaning the eggs all the time. Because when they meet, the dominant fish in the breeding cavity, they will submit. It's, it's the best one. And you saw this egg cleaning behavior and then the female came. And if, if a fish is in the breeding cavity and it comes out and the breeder comes in, it will also submit to it. So it is, it is really owing to this particular situation, but it showed us for the first time that we have these types. I think that was the important thing that we saw, okay, there's something going on. But the fish really, it could either see, the, so it had really to do active movement to, to, to do these two things. If, if the dominant would have sw swimming around, been swimming around, in this experimental tank, probably the, 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 the egg cleaner would also know and then have showed submission. But in these rearing experiments, we saw that it's a quantitative difference, really. So that's the one that, that we find the statistical differences between, I didn't show you the raw data, right? In this, five-year picture where, where we have these two uh, life histories. I didn't show you the raw pictures. Of course, there were variation around the means in that study, but um, we have significant differences between, in, in each of these tests we did, what the fish were doing. Yeah, it's not an all, it, it, I think in the field, it's not such an all or nothing response as in this one plot I showed you. Thank you. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is. I think, I, think it's a, I think it's a beautiful, I'm thinking of my courses on research methods and, and my always advocacy for really doing both field and lab. I mean, when he's speaking so, so clearly about the internal validity of the design, 
the award, but but it's only when you go to the field where you really kind of extend the, the external validity and the extent to which you can generalize. So it's, yeah. it's it's a beautiful example of how we need both, and we're getting yeah. different different pieces of the puzzle from 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 each. What we also need is to see the specialization in the field. I'm waiting for someone doing that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So because, yeah, you have this experimental situation where you see, okay, something's going on. But in the field, um, I, I uh, actually, one of my students is working on a data set. Who she, she made films of these groups. She tries to find out, but we don't know yet what comes out. And I really hope that, that from that material or from future studies, we will see how, how strong this specialization is. When you have marked fish, marked groups, how do you see the specialization also in the field, or is everything overruled by overruled by size effects, which would be a bit mm. uh, trivial? Then, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then we have another question by Chingyu. Yeah, hi, it's me again. So I have just an, another quick question about inbreedings. So, have you ever observed any uh, inbreedings like? within the group, like between the helpers, if they are not dispersed? Um, there has been a study about inbreeding depression in Persia, and there was found some inbreeding depression, um, but that was not between the helpers and the pairs, but between the pair members, they just used related and unrelated pair members. Um, for the helpers, I cannot tell you, it is not extremely frequent that they contribute to reproduction, but of course, when they take over the group, then they may be still related to some of the fish. Um, so in a natural setting, we, we have no evidence of inbreeding impression. We rather had the feeling they are pretty robust. And that's why I was so surprised when uh, it was a master student of Michael, I think, when she sort of forced the fish to inbreed that she had, that this fish had a lower fertility or something. So there was some inbreeding depression going on, but from just keeping the fish and breeding them over the time, we, we did not, we don't see obvious effects. And in wild, we have no, no, no good information. Perhaps I can add here, if I may interfere shortly, uh, in, an, in another uh, master uh, project, we found that uh, in the mate choice experiment, they do not make any difference between related and unrelated potential partners. So even though there is a negative effect of inbreeding, they, they don't care about it apparently in the, in the choice of mm. mating. But that was the same study. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good, then may, maybe related to this, you, you mentioned during your talk several times that there's um, indeterminate growth, they grow throughout their life. And you also mentioned that um, there's relatively a high turnover of, so of the breeders. So the breeders mm -hmm. are less close related to the bigger helpers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know whether you, did you mention whether is there a higher risk of breeders to get predated because they're larger and they're first a better prey for the, for the predator and they're maybe less able to hide within in the services. Is there a cost of, of growing that it reduces predation risk? I, I wouldn't think so, because as you probably know, as you have worked with fish, there is this um, strong size structure that the smallest are eaten most, and <laughs> the largest are eaten least, because the, the fish predators are gape size limited. And of course, you have fewer large individuals of the predator than there are a lot of medium sized uh, predators around and small predators around. So I think it is really that you can outgrow the risk. It's, it's rather the opposite. Yeah. So I think the bigger you are, the, in, in the fewer mouths you fit, and that's why also your predation risk is, is lower. Um, I, I've never had the impression that they cannot hide well, fit fast enough, or that they are too big to fit in a crevice, because they know their crevices very well, and they go straight to their heights. So these fish have, interestingly, they have, um, own shelters within the territory where they live. So also all these helpers, they have what we call private shelters. 
and I think they they always know the shortest way to the next to either their shelter or to the next shelter they fit in. It's it's uh, they know very well where they go, and um, they are actually at risk from a certain size class onwards because they feed in the in outside of the territory. So that may be the only thing I could imagine that there is somewhere a break as soon as they start to feed outside the territory for plankton, that that makes their life riskier. But a very big breeder should always be safer from my point of view than a, a smaller breeder because of the gap size limit situation. Okay. Then we have a question by Marin Hook. Hello, um, I'm Marin Hook from the University of Derby. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the dispersal process. So how, how far do they actually disperse in a natural environment and how, how long does it take to find a new group or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's also something that was not studied by me, but but this but by the student of Michael, because it's most of the field work is actually not from my group. So as far as I understand it, these fish, um, before they disperse, they make visits to neighboring groups, which can go over weeks. And Michael can correct me; maybe it goes also over months, which we call prospecting. So they. When they disperse, and we and the student, she has really direct observations. When they disperse, they don't just swim out of the territory and hope that they find a place, but they know already where to go, and they form little like like relationships with this new group already. So that because if they would just leave the territory and let's see whether I find a group, and then they enter a group and they are evicted, as I said several times, it's super super dangerous. So they build up these relationships and then they go exactly to that place which they have visited before. And I think it can go over several, several weeks. They would, um, the distances they can um, disperse are highly variable, but most of them disperse close to the home territory. So two, three, four territories away, which is an area they can cover in, during their visits. We had very few cases um, actually from Seagull Bellschein's group where I think they found a fish in one kilometer distance or so, which is amazing. But um, normally it's, it's, it's close distances, which can be covered by this. So it's local, locally, rather local. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Very well, thank you very much, Barbara. That was really an amazing talk. We, uh, we all enjoyed it and we all enjoy um, when people have these possibilities to do really experiments um, in, in that great detail also from um, from the mechanisms of developmental plasticity over molecular mechanisms and um, to the evolutionary and ecological relevance so thank you very much for this You're and um, before I st stop the sharing on YouTube I would like to remind everyone who is still here that next week Adriana Maldonada Chaparro is going to present I hope I'm um, most of you or all of you will, will be here for this. And then with this, um, I'm stopping the sharing on YouTube. And then, but then we can still, um, yeah. I mean, I can ask the cuckoo question, but I don't know if, if, I can answer it. <laughs> if Barbara cannot answer it, then Maren has to, to answer it. Um, so the question is, he's, it's from Arlene Vishoyen. She says it's, I think it's a she, um, a question that is off topic. What do you think about the implications of progesterone hormone levels of host parents of cuckoo chicks since usually progesterone mm -hmm. declines after hatching? Mm -hmm. I would be happy if Maren can answer it. <laughs> so, um, um, I have not I, really thought about the hormonal side of this cuckoo business, but it's, a, it's, it's certainly an interesting question. Does anyone else have a comment on that? Do we, any, do we have any bird specialists? I mean, my here? comment is that this is a good reason to come to the fine in fall, uh -huh. because I know Wolfgang Goyman once worked on progesterone in birds and in cuckoos. But um, if we cannot solve this mystery um, tonight, then... Um, 
it's really That's important to come point, back yeah. to all the other files that are coming. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, then I'm, I'm stopping the live screen here, but of course everybody is still